So I've got today a random GBA uh, that has a presumed fault. When the guys build consoles and they come across issues they can't solve, I tell them to just chuck it in a pile and we'll come back later and fix it. Now seems like the perfect time to start working through that pile of broken consoles and teaching you guys how I repair things. We have the suspected bad console. Uh, there's no notes on it, so I've got no idea what's wrong with it. Um, it's just literally presumed broken. I've got a known working screen, so I can at least see the screen of that works. Um, some known working rubbers, two good games, one for GBA and one for GB, because they have two cores on the GBA, one to play the GB games, one to play the GBA, and one might work and the other might not. And then another working speaker, because I'm not sure whether the speaker works. So that's all we're going to need to start taking a look at this console and seeing what's wrong. So let's just jump straight in. So in order to diagnose and repair things, you really only need two things as a definite. One is the bench power supply that I have here. Relying on just batteries to power things removes a lot of ability to diagnose problems. So I would heavily recommend investing in a bench power supply. I am currently reviewing the cheapest options you can have that are still good enough to do diagnostics. Uh, and I'll show you and share that with you soon. Uh, on top of a bench power supply, we also have a multimeter. So I've got a digital multimeter uh, that I can just chuck up on screen so you guys can see uh, my multimeter uh, whenever you need to. So if I just turn that on now, you'll see in the top left, this is a live uh, multimeter. So if I was to connect the multimeter to the bench power supply and do a quick check, and you can see there we have the three volts. So currently we have a multimeter and a bench power supply, and we should be able to do nearly all of the work we need using these two tools. So let's start with the very first steps. I'll move all this stuff off we don't need for now. Just move it to one side, and we'll use that when we need to. I don't really need a working screen because I can always test with audio if this speaker turns out to be working. So what's the very first thing I do when I get a board like this? Well, I want to check it actually powers up. So I'm going to grab the bench power supply. I'm going to connect it to ground. And on the GBA, the batteries connect here and here. So you have ground through an AA, across and back through another AA. So you'd have 1.5 volts plus 1.5 volts, you'd have 3 volts going into here. As you can see on our bench, we have it set up for 3 volts. And if we quickly just tap the bench power supply together, you can see that it shorts out and limits it to 1 amp, which is the current limit I've set on this bench. That's just a quick test that we know this is good and this is working. So now if we apply 3 volts to the battery pin and turn the power switch on, you can see we're not getting any power here. This is the amps that we want to see go up. I know from experience a working board is about 50 to 70 milliamps, so 0.05 to 0.07, and we're getting absolutely nothing. So at this point, some people just make presumptions. The fuse is blown, the switch is dead. I like to test and prove things by actually looking at them and testing the components. So let's just take a look at this under the scope and see what we're dealing with. And let's just take a look around the power area. So we have the battery springs here. And already we can see the fuse right here is actually missing. There is no fuse here. This is just um, nothing. So if somebody's robbed a fuse off here by the looks of it. So what happens is when you apply power, the power comes in from here, the three volts. The first place it goes is through the fuse, and then it goes into this power switch. It goes into pin two here. This switch then, when it's in the on position, acts like a metal wire bridge going from 2 over to C. C is the common, and this is the power to the rest of the Game Boy. So Game Boy power should come out here at 3 volts. So it would travel from here, through the fuse, into pin 2, and when the switch is on, it would travel through and over to C. This would apply power to the board. When you turn the switch off, you imagine there's a metal wire running here. You slide the switch over, that metal wire now goes from here to here instead. These two pads are both common, so they're effectively joined to the same pad. And now the switch is bridging common over to pin one. So this would then take the power that's currently in the system that's stored in these capacitors because the battery is no longer connected 
but it's stored in these capacitors and it will send it through pin one. Pin one goes across here and to this resistor that's also missing. <laughs> so it looks like people have been using this board as a bit of a donut. So you can see there R13, there should be a resistor on there and there's just an open space. So there is nothing there. Um, so that will need replacing as well. Uh, if you don't replace that, it wouldn't stop the console powering up, uh, which is the current issue we have, but it would cause an issue when you turn the console off and on again fast, because what would happen is you'd turn the console off and these capacitors wouldn't discharge very quick. They'd stay at a, a certain voltage. So let's leave resistor R13 off. Let's fix the fuse and see if we get power. And if we do, we'll then test the power switch, clean the power switch, and also show you the symptoms of R13 being missing. So I don't currently have a fuse on me, so I'm just going to bridge the fuse gap. All the fuse does is blow when there's excessive current flowing through it. My bench meter is currently limited to 1 amp anyway, and the fuse is a 1.25 amp. So we already have protection using the bench power supply. So for now, I'll just bridge the fuse. Uh, when we come to fully restore this, we would replace it with a fuse. Again, we sell these parts in our store, so if you want the fuses, uh, we have the fuses for all the consoles. So that's the fuse now joined. So power should now flow from here, through the fuse, and through the switch to C. So let's just see if the console works first. Let's get the scope out of the way. So we've repaired that fuse. So let's just chuck up the bench power supply. We'll connect ground to ground again. And we will connect the three volts to the battery spring. We go no amps at the minute, but let's turn it on. And you can see we now have 55, 54 milliamps, uh, which is what we're after. So here looks like we've got a booting working console. Now, because this resistor is missing, if we turn this off and on fast, there you go, it doesn't boot up. You've got 0.001, so nothing basically. This is an issue and this is the reason for R13. When you turn the console off, or rather, let's start at the beginning. When you turn the console on, this three volts charges all these capacitors up. Every capacitor on the board stores charge. So when we disconnect the battery, like this, these capacitors all still have current running through them. And the system will slowly consume that over 10 to 20 seconds. But the problem then becomes when you want to turn the console back on fast, so if we go off and on, it won't work. So let's see that in action because I like to show that it's actually there and doing something. So let's just pull up the multimeter. I'm going to connect the ground to ground. I should really label these wires as well so it's easier to see. But we have the power input here from the bench. I'm going to just put this connector back on. And during power to the board again. So we have power on the board now. And we can see that it's 3 volts. We can test with the multimeter. And this shows us that it's 3 volts. And now if I check the... You can check the C pin, which is the power to the board here. But this capacitor here, CP1, is also the same thing. So you can see the minute that's got nothing in it. If we turn the console on... You can see it jumps to three volts and the system's booted. Now, if I turn this off, the indicator up the top left for the voltage is what's in the Game Boy system at the minute. So these capacitors and the system. So when I turn this off now, it's no longer receiving power, but you see how it's still one volt, 0.5 volts, 0.4 volts. It's slowly going down. Now the system won't be fully turned off till about 0.2 volts. So if I turn it on now, about 0.25 volts, it should be fine and it boots. But if you see if I turn it off, and while the voltage is still 1 volt, turn it back on, the system doesn't boot, and now it gets stuck. And there we go, it's, it's got 3 volts coming in, but the system isn't booted. So if we turn it off again, you can see that that value is collapsing, and the speed at which it collapses is important. So 0.5, let's try it there. So 0.5 volts, it works fine. Turn it off. Let's wait, 0.6 works fine. So it looks like it needs to drop to around 0.6 volts before the system can be restarted. So currently, without the resistor down here, when we turn it off, that discharge is quite slow. So let's now install a resistor to fix this issue. 
But if you experience or see that issue, then you should understand that the R13 resistor is what is discharging your Game Boy when you turn it off. So if you're experiencing issues where you turn your console off and on again fast and it fails to boot, this is common between most Game Boys, you'll find that there's a discharge resistor that basically drains the system power faster so that it can start up again. So let's just pull the scope in and get this resistor on. So we go down to this resistor here by the power switch. And the value of this resistor isn't over important. I think the stock one is about 150 ohms. But honestly, anything from 50 ohms to 300 ohms or anywhere in between is probably perfectly fine. So I'll just grab a 150 ohm resistor and just tack this on. And there we have the resistor on. And let's take another loop. So now we have the resistor on. Let's set up the system again the same way. So we want the grounds going to the battery. We got the power going to the power input. Let's bring up our meters. And again, let's just test everything's working. We can see we have three volts there as the input. And if we go on to CP1, which is the Game Boy's power, you can see we have nothing at the minute. We turn it on. We get the three volts and the system booting. Now when we turn it off, you can see how fast that drops to zero volts. So if we turn it back on again, it should be fine. And you watch the voltage on the top left, it goes from 3 volts off to 0 instantly. And that delay is simply this multimeter taking its time to update. So as you turn it off, it discharges rapidly. Which now means we can turn the console on, off. And I know the console's booting when I'm looking at this amperage here. So it's going 50 milliamps, turn it off. So if I just move this out of the way, you go off on 50 milliamps, off, on 50 milliamps. So that's now allowed the console to turn on and off nice and fast. So that solved two issues. Let's just move these out of the way. So this may have been the only problem with this board, but again, just a quick glance, I can spot there's actually a headphone jack missing, and there also appears to be a rubber here missing. Uh, they're cosmetic, we can swap those parts out, and um, that's not really an issue. Function-wise, we're just trying to repair this board. Um, so let's now connect a screen up. One thing actually, we haven't heard any sound saying that. So let's just connect the power back up. And check if we got any sound. So there's power on. And... Turn the console on, don't hear anything that way, turn the volume wheel this way, turn it on. No, so we also don't have audio. So let's see if the system is booting. Let's just chuck in this bomber man. And let's chuck in a screen. Or let's perhaps do that the right way around. Let's connect the screen first. Then Bomberman, and then let's apply some power, see what we get. So you can see it's booting, but we don't have audio now. So let's turn the volume wheel up and down. There's various things we can do here to find what the issue with audio is. Sometimes you can investigate and go far into trying to find a problem. Other times you can just do something simple like start with the obvious, just quickly swap a speaker if we've got it to hand. There's no need to go too far into diagnosing some things when you could quickly test them. So there is ways we can test this, uh, but let's just start with the really quick and obvious and just swap the speaker first and see what that does.
So just take the speaker off, just put some fresh solder on, and then put your finger on the speaker, apply some pressure lifting up, and then just warm both pads as you're lifting up, and the speaker comes out. Now a speaker is just a coil of wire wrapped around with a magnet, electromagnet that drives the diaphragm up and down making sound. So in essence, these two wires should be joined on a working speaker. So let's just prove that that's the case first. So now we have some speaker wire. Let's just touch on that side, touch on this side. And you can see now 7.7 .7 ohms. So this is a working speaker and we have connection, or at least the wires connected. It's not necessarily saying it is going to work. So let's just check this speaker, because this will help us to see whether the speaker was working and it's possibly another issue. So yeah, this speaker seems to be working. So the likelihood is then, when we install this new speaker on, we should still not have sound because that wasn't the problem. We had a working speaker. But just to prove that assumption, let's solder the speaker on anyway. Doesn't matter which way around the speaker goes, by the way, you can solder it either way. So there's the speaker. Now let's get this out of the way. And let's get some power back on this board. And for this, I am just going to quickly attach a wire so I don't have to have this floating around everywhere because we are going to be doing more tests. So let me just quickly cut a piece of wire. In fact, I'll do it on both. So we've got nice long wires to keep these big heavy leads out of the way while we're working. So I'll just disconnect this for now. If the wire's thin, you can just place the iron on it to melt the insulation around the edges. You can also use wire strippers, but I'm a bit lazy and tend to just melt the end off. Let's just put some fresh solder over the battery springs makes it easier to solder to. When it's a big connection like this, you tend to feed some solder in and then just wait for a lot longer than you typically would for most joints until you see the solder disappear. And then after that point, you go back to being fairly quick on the soldering because you've now got a good uh, thermal transfer point. I'll do more videos on soldering specifics, but for now this is just about mostly fixing the console. We have a ground wire there we can use, and we have a power wire there. Uh, these ends are actually going to be connected to the crocodile clips, so I'm going to strip them a lot more, so there's plenty exposed. And now I can apply power with it being out the way and not getting in my way. So let's just do that. Apply ground. Apply power. And let's test this still boots up. So let's just chuck up the power on there and you can see that boots and we have a screen working. So where do we go now with audio not working? Well, I know enough about the audio, considering I've made new audio amps uh, for many consoles. But say you didn't know that, you could look around the board and familiarise yourself with how boards typically look and what you're normally looking for. So I'm also going to get the screen out of the way for now in the game, because we know the console's booting, and now we can just listen out for audio. So when I'm looking around boards, you typically find that near the power supply, you'll find big caps or big ceramic caps. Um, normally a black chip, which is your regulator, um, sometimes inductors like this, you'll start to get familiar with how certain patterns of certain things look. So this is a classic power regulation area, and this kind of layout of components is typical power regulation. When you look on the back, this says CPU, so you kind of know it's a CPU. Um, this is RAM, uh, which again is connected directly to the CPU, uh, and the part numbers give it away if you Google it. So there's lots of telltale signs of how to generally look at boards once you've done a few and spot what common components are and make assumptions. So what's left down here is a volume wheel, a headphone jack that's missing. Um, we have the capacitor that's stabilizing the amp and this is the amp because I know it is. Now the fact that we have a headphone jack missing, some people might not suspect anything there, but again, I've made amps for this console, so I do know that the headphone socket is actually important. 
and the headphone socket should be grounding one of its pads when there is no headphone inserted and when you insert a headphone it removes the ground and floats the pad. So at the minute with having no headphone jack connected it will be floating the pad that needs to be grounded and causing the audio to turn off on the speaker but presumably work through the headphone jack. So the fix for this would be to solder the correct pad to ground. But it makes a perfect time now for me to show you how I would know these things or how you can learn these things. So let's just place this to one side for a moment and jump into the schematic. So here is the Game Boy Advance schematic. So this shows us what the circuitry on the circuit board does, where it's connected to. Uh, they used to release these back in the day. Now they're a lot less willing to release schematics. Uh, they're ideal for repairing things. But this is generally... It's more of a rough guide than anything to answer questions for you. You still have to know a good bit about hardware to understand what you're doing or what you're looking at. But at the same time, you can also just look at the schematic and see if anything looks like it should be there or shouldn't be there or makes any kind of sense to you. So let's just scroll down. You can find these if you just search online. Um, you'll find the schematic, no problem. And don't be too overwhelmed. Just, just dive in, look around and see what you might spot. So for example here, it says power switch. So clearly there's the power switch. And as we saw, pin one going over to the right side of the console goes through R13, which is a 150 ohm resistor. So this is the symbol for a resistor. Uh, these are symbols, not so much these anymore. These are old symbols for capacitors, but capacitors are typically two lines. Uh, if one's curved, it usually means it's um, polarized. Uh, but either way, not too much to dive into schematics, but just generally to give you an overview at the minute. You can see the battery spring here. So we have battery spring negative, battery spring positive, and these are the batteries sitting in between. The power comes in through the battery, goes through fuse one, which was missing, goes into pin two of the switch. Then the switch, as you can see here, indicated by a line, that's like joining two pads. So when it's off in this illustrated position, pin one to pin C is off. So it joins C, which goes out to the rest of the system, up through, down to one through the resistor. When you turn it on, the switch slides over and C joins to two, which means the batteries coming into two now go into C. So that's how that power switch we were just doing worked. You can see CP1 here was the bottom of that capacitor I was touching to get a quick test point on where this power was connecting to. And then after that, it goes into the voltage regulator here and everything else happens to regulate voltage out to the system. So that's the power side, but we're more concerned about the audio side at the minute. So if we look at the audio, it's fairly easy to spot. There's a speaker here. So there's the speaker pads we just swapped out. And here is the actual original amplifier for the Game Boy. So that's the black chip we saw next to the volume wheel. So what happens with the audio? is it comes from, if you look here, this big long line is the CPU. So this big long black line here is CPU that goes to everything. So if we zoom in and look at the amp, you can see here SD1 or SO1, sound out one is likely what it means. Left and right, it says there, or out, all out. So the left and right audio come out through the GBA and through R31 and R30. So without even needing to know what they do, we do know we should see on a scope sound coming out at the first point from the CPU should be this R30 and R31. So those should be the first two points that you notice sound coming out if we were to diagnose missing sound. We can do that if we find we don't have sound, but for now I think we will. So the sound comes into the amplifier, it says R in and L in, so it's fairly obvious. You have vol here that goes up through this indication symbol here, which is a resistor with an arrow. This is the symbol for a variable resistor, which is basically the volume wheel. So we have the volume wheel here, which feeds back into the amp uh, as a vol pin to tell it what volume to output. So if this pin was the wrong voltage, which we could measure, this might cause no audio coming out. Also, if the chip didn't have any power, so you can see VDD, Anywhere you see VDD or VCC is typically power. Whenever you see that, you'd expect power. VDD5 likely means 5 volts. So you'd probably expect to see 5 volts on pin 12. Uh, VCC1 here goes to VCC, so you'd expect this to probably be 3.3 volts. Um, same for pin 16. 
So if you're having issues, the natural steps would be to check, do you have ground? Is ground connected to ground? Do all the VCC and VDD pins or ones that show the go to VDDs actually have power to show that this chip is capable of running? And then you just make assumptions from experience as you go. So the thing that says vol, you'd expect to mean volume. You'd take a working board and measure the voltage here on a working board when you have audio and compare it to a non-working board and give you an indication of something's wrong. Um, going past that, if we look here, this is the headphone jack. This is what I know will be causing an issue. It might not be the only one, but it will be causing an issue. So the symbol here is a bit strange, but it's basically a headphone jack going in. Uh, the tip looks like it's uh, here, this pin here, and the sleeves are here left and right. Um, so pin 3 is right audio, pin 2 is left audio, pin 1 is the tip, and then you've got 5 and 4. And this leaves, this is the switch that happens when you physically insert a headphone jack, pin 5 and 4, disconnect or connect. So to test that, and to know that, you take a working board. Um, and then if you look at what happens, pin 4, if you follow the line, goes all the way across, all the way across, and this is the ground symbol. Again, it's an old symbol for ground, but that's a ground symbol. So we know pin 4 is grounded, and pin 5 goes back to the amp, to a pin called SW, which will probably stand for switch, as in switching between speaker and headphones. So again, I know this because I've done enough of them. But pin 4 and 5 will go between simply not being connected, so pin 5 won't be connected to anything, to being connected to ground when the headphones is in. I know this is going to be an issue and prevent the speaker from working, so I'm going to swap that first, and instead of just putting a headphone jack on, I'm just going to short out pin 5 to 4, or effectively just pin 5 to any ground point. So if I just show you firstly, let's get a working board in as well. Or I presume is a working board, I'm pretty sure this one works. And we can see here, if I flip this over, this is our current board. And the headphone socket is here, that's missing. If I bring in this working board, and just check the testers are working, which they are. Here's pin 4 and 5. So on the schematic, pin 4 should be ground. So ground, we can go to the battery over here. The battery negative is ground. And pin 5, you can see, is also ground. Now you might think that's always the case, but if we look at our current board, what we should find is 4 is ground, which it is, but 5 shouldn't be. And why is that? It's because in this headphone socket, and specifically here, is a spring. So when we insert something into the socket, let me see if I can get this on scope for you. So you can see inside the headphone socket here, if we connect the testers to ground, and we can see in here and touch this, this is ground. And see this pin here that goes to pin five? This is this metal pin that comes along here and touches this, which is pin four. So this is pin four, this arm is pin five. When we insert headphone socket into the slot, so if I just insert the testers, you can see, if I can do it right, it does this. So it pushes this spring away from ground. So now pin five up here is floating because it's not connecting to anything. And when you release, it makes contact again. So you can also see how oxidized and dirty this is. So if this got dirty and this metal wire here or this metal spring here wasn't joining pin five to ground, you wouldn't get audio. So this is also a very common cause of simply having no audio out of speakers. And it's not the amp and it's not the speaker, it's literally the headphone jack not connecting pin 5 to 4. You'll see in the troubleshooting guide for the clean amp, that's why I recommend shorting pin 5 on the amp to ground directly to prove whether or not it's the headphone jack. So back to our board, we know that pin 5 is going to cause a problem if we don't ground it. So we could connect a headphone socket to here. But again, I don't want the video to be full of just replacing components that I know aren't really a problem as such. Similar to this rubber up here for the trigger. We could test that as well after, but for now we could just put a tweezers in and press the button. So when we can work around it just to get the board working first and solve the known problems, we'll do that. When we come to then restore this to use, we'd obviously put a headphone socket on. 
But let's just prove that's the problem first. Let's just get a bit of wire and let's just short pad five to pad four. And it's not necessarily needed to go to pad four, it's just simply that pad four is ground and it's the closest pad. So we'll make use of it. But you could short pin five to any other ground on the board. So let's just pull up the power as well. Um, let's check where we're at with this. They're still connected, so this still turns on. Let's turn it off. Let's put some fresh solder on five. And then let's just connect this to, whoops, try that again. Connect this to ground. And that's now connected. So, do we get sound now? There we go. So, and the volume wheel works. We now have sound. So I can just check a game in here as well. To make sure it's not gritty or any other kind of issue. And if the volume wheel was dirty, then as you're scrolling, you'd hear kind of gritty choppy changes. If your game doesn't load as well, by the way, um, you'll get obviously the corrupted Nintendo logo. Uh, but if you just get IPA fluid, cover your game in it, and then just insert and remove the game, like 20 times typically, to really clean the pins. What you're doing is applying IPA fluid to these gold contacts, and you're rubbing them gold contacts against the cartridge slot contacts and removing any oxidation to make the connection better. Uh, and then we'll check it sounds good. So we have a working screen, working audio. I can check the buttons now as well. There we go, so. You can see that sounds nice, that's smooth. So let's just check the buttons work. Start with the select button, remove these ribbons out the way, screen out the way, uh, let's check the select. And yep, that moved the game on. Check the start, yep. Check the up and down. Just chuck these on. Get them over center. Yep, seems to be working. Check the A and B. And that's the B, which I don't think will work at this stage. Oh, press start helps if you read. And then quest. Oh yeah, B came out of the menu. So B was working. There we go. B and start and then A. So all buttons seem to be working. And then we've got the triggers. Quickest way to test the triggers, I find, is to put in a GBO game, an original game. And when it's at the start, if you tap the triggers, it expands and retracts or you can even do it in game so if i just get tweezers for now and push in there so these triggers don't appear to be doing anything so let's just quickly test if that is right on a working game I'm sure the left and right expand the screen so let's just put grippers on here so that turns on yeah so you can actually see the triggers should be doing that. So on top of all the other issues, we also have trigger issues. So let's fix that now. This is why it's good to have a working console to compare to. Connect this back in. Connect the power back up. And let's double check we still have that issue. Oh, the wires just fell off the connector for a second. There we go. So yeah, you can see that's not doing anything to expand that. And neither is that. So, let's have a quick look at the triggers. I'll show you how these work. 
So all of these buttons work in a very similar way. Basically one side of say this down pad here will be connected to ground. So you can see the right, the left side is connected to ground. The right side is connected to the CPU. So it goes to here to be processed and that's all that happens. So if I go to the right side of the button and just go up and down these legs, you can see that this pad here connects to down. So all that happens is the CPU sends the D-pad high to three volts, say. And when we join this three volts to ground, it lowers the voltage to zero and the CPU knows it's been pressed. So all these rubber pads do is if we measure resistance, this is just carbon. On, so it looks like it's rubber, but these black dots are actually carbon dots. So if we measure a point from here to here along the carbon, You can see it's about 100 ohms. So it's not quite a dead short, but it's enough to bring down the voltage that the CPU sends the button high. So all we're doing when we hover these pads over and pressing down is adding 90 ohms resistance between these two pads, or in essence, you could just dead short them. You could just join them together, and it would act like it's been pressed. So you can find in games, if you just take tweezers that are solid metal, and if we tested the tweezers resistance, from one end to the other. You can see these tweezers are a dead short to the zero, the, the one ohm basically. So if we took the tweezers and we did this on the pads and touched over, it would actually act like we've done the exact same thing as putting a rubber pad over and pressed. So if you ever see people using tweezers to quickly test and do things, that's all that's happening. So knowing that, all these buttons work the same way. They basically have one side to ground and the other side should get shorted when you, you press them. Let's have a look at why the triggers aren't working. So we should know that one side of the triggers is grounded. And I happen to know the bottom, for instance, is this cage. So these bottom two pads are just the cage and they're just grounded. So if we check ground for them, uh, we actually go to continuity mode again, so it beeps. We have ground ground which is what we want and then these two top pads are the actual buttons so similar to the pads here there's two sides so one side of these two should be ground which is that side and the other side there is the one that will go to the cpu if we take a quick look at the schematic you can see that the a b start select up down left right all go straight to the cpu However, the triggers, R and L, go through a resistor first, and they've also got a capacitor to smooth debouncing. This is to stop really fast bouncing inside the mechanical switch. So if we did continuity from the L and R buttons straight to the CPU, it wouldn't work. We've got to read the readings through the resistors first. So if we look at R, it's got a resistor R43, and L has got a resistor R44. So let's take a look at them on the board. And we can see here, we've got the switch there, which would be the left switch. And we have a resistor here, labelled R44. We go to the right switch, and you can see R43 here, as well as the capacitor that should go to ground. So, what that means is, let's check this side first as well for ground. So that's ground, that's ground, that's ground. So, all three sides of the switch are ground. This side of the switch then should connect to R43, which it does. And then the other side of R43 should connect to the CPU. So let's see if we can do that. This will be awkward to try and get, but this side of R43, hold it like this. Might be hard to record, but let me just test. And then if we go down the CPU legs, See if we find any that actually make connection. And again, if you're unsure, you could take a working board to test this out. Or we could actually look at the schematic quickly. And look, the R43 should be connected to TP8. So you can see here, we zoom in a little bit. You can see R43 goes to TP8 and R44 
44 goes to TP9. So we can quickly check it with TP8 and TP9. And they go to pin 3 and 119 on the CPU. So let's see if we can see the TP test points, which stand for test point basically, and they're normally little circles that stand out. So if we turn it over, you can see here we've got TP8 there. So I would say TP8 here should be connected to the resistor. So we hold that in and check if it's connected first to the resistor. It is. So we can safely say so far this button connects to TP8. And TP8 was pin 3, I think, on the CPU, or pin 119, one or the other. So you can see the numbers here going around the CPU. So one starts here. So one of them was 3. And there you go, it's touching out to 3. So we have a physical connection from here all the way to the CPU. So that should be working. Let's check this trigger as well. We wanted TP8, uh, TP9. TP9 I can see is here. So again, let's first make sure that TP9 is connected. So if we go to the resistor on the back and we go to the opposite side after it's passed through the resistor, we can see that's also making contact. So now we can test TP9 and is it going into pad 119 was the other one, which is somewhere along here because we have 103 to 128. So we hold TP9 here. And we go down to somewhere around 119. There we go. So, they work. So what's left if this is working? We haven't tested whether this physical button is working. So what should happen when you press this button? Just like when you put the carbon down onto here, the graphite, it should join together. So when we press this button, here to here should join. So we press button in it says joining so that seems to be fully functional so there's no reason why this trigger shouldn't work the same for this one this will be difficult to test because there's no rubber in don't know how I'm going to do this with one hand well I know this pads ground so I can just go to ground over here and I can try then to press in here while holding that down Tell you what, let me just rub a rubber off a working board instead for the minute. If we have any with rubbers, no I don't. So this one at the minute is hard to test because there's no trigger in. So let's ignore that for the minute. Um, let's do a quick inspection of the CPU to make sure there's nothing around those pins, potentially bringing them low. So we can see here pin 3 is this pin here. And there's nothing untoward on that pin, there's no shorts, there's nothing out of the ordinary there. Uh, pin 119, we'll have to count a little bit, but we have pin 128 here. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, 1. So this here is also fine. So this seems like we have everything physically connected right. So next steps to figuring out uh, non-working triggers here. We need to now see something on the multimeter at a minimum. So I want to see what a working board does first. So let's bring back a working board. And I want to see, I'm presuming this will be 3 volts or 5 volts, and when we press to ground it will sink. So let's just prove that theory. And we can also test the other board afterwards and the CPU pins to make sure it's happening right. So there's the console booting, which we can hear. And then let's check that it's working first, that we have voltage coming up, which we do. So now the trigger here has 3.1 volts, or 3.2, 3.3, roughly that. Yep, 3.2 volts. When we press the button down, it goes to ground. I presume the other one will work exactly the same. 3 volts, suppress, goes to ground. Let's check on the resistor, so after the resistor. This resistor here. And exactly the same. So the working board is doing what I'd expect, which is to set it to high voltage, and then when you press the trigger, lower the voltage again. So let's get our board now. 
there's the sound let's get the testers and we can test this side it doesn't really matter this time um, we can go to the test point so the test point is there you can see we have 3.3 volts uh, that's the trigger I can't test let's try this one TP8 or 9 3.3 volts press down oh look at that it's not actually lowering the voltage so even though the button is apparently working pressing the trigger isn't bringing it down so we could have bad resistors here let's check directly to um, ground over here and straight to the actual trigger itself and the trigger is actually not getting voltage unless I'm just testing really bad one second let me get in a better position for this yeah, so let's test again so the one we can test over here ground to power let's make sure that's working this side of the switch should have three volts which it doesn't so the issue is we have three volts I presume at this side of the resistor because we had it on the rear but this side of the resistor oh we also have it oh was I testing the wrong pad no I wasn't so that means from here the resistor going to here to here is broken so let's test if that's correct so if we go to continuity even though the button was working the one spot we didn't test was between this side of the resistor to here this basically this line let's test the testers work and look at that we don't have a connection so there's the issue I'm gonna make a presumption that the other side's the same which likely means whoever swapped these triggers out has probably lifted the pads when we're doing it or oh, this one is working and um, we just never noticed because one expands the screen and one contracts the screen and we just simply didn't notice that's a potential but let's check if this is connected so that's connected so the likelihood is this switch will work uh, we just need to physically press it but this one is broken so let's take a look under the scope at that so let's zoom in now on the scope and let's see if we can see and basically it's a very short trace and it looks like it's connected perfectly fine but it mustn't be because we're not making contact so we could scrape away at the silk screen here to see if there's a connection but that line just goes straight to the switch and looks fine so there you go you can actually see a real hairline missing line there I think unless it's my eyes but it does look like a very small hairline fracture it's very hard to see even zoomed in But I believe it is. You can see just here. See that little line that isn't copper? I believe that's the broken trace. So the simple fix, anyway, we know it's broken. I just wanted to see if it was obvious to show you, but it's not that obvious. Is we'll just add a wire between the two. So we'll do a quick check first before we fix it, and then a quick check after. So testers are working. We currently, if we're still right, don't have a connection from here to here, which is correct. Even though we can see that line going straight to there, it doesn't have a connection as soon as it leaves. So it must be broken, and it's just very hard to see. So we'll take some wire. This is such a short trace, and there's nothing else there either, so we don't need to worry too much about insulating the wire. We can just strip the wire and solder straight across. We could use conformal coating to cover the connection after, but for now, again, this is just about the repair. So let's get some fresh solder on the trigger, fresh solder on the resistor. Let's place the wire onto the big pad first. And then, if we actually, let's do it the other way around. 
circle us around. Let's place this onto the trigger here. And now get the wire just into position and make a connection there. Um, just move it out of the way of that via. And there we go, we have a connection there. And I then just wiggle this wire. We've now got that. Let's get the testers again and see if we now have a connection. And we do. So let's test again on the game. So now turn on. That button now works, and I presume this one was always working. Yep, we just didn't know it because this one was the one that shrinks the screen. So, there we have now a fully working console that had a broken speaker, or in essence a broken headphone connector because it was simply missing. Um, a missing fuse, a missing resistor, damaged triggers. Hopefully you've learned a lot on this repair. Um, this is how I like to do them, just simply start with it, figure out what's wrong and solve the problems. Any questions, just let me know. I'm always happy to answer them, and I hope you enjoyed it.